Hey y'all, we're back to quench some gooches. <laughs> Karen's like, no. Um, no, I was on mute because I was naming the episode and I didn't want y'all to hear me to click it. Clack, clack, click it. Exactly. And then I was just laughing into the void where no one could hear me. <laughs> okay, so this week we are going to uh, listen to season two episode four titled second mm-hmm. time around which is this was a good one it is a good one you picked a great one it is in a lot of ways our lives which we said on the show right yeah that was like, the episode like, that i said i had breast cancer mm-hmm. it was like like that again i was like yo we was in our bag on that bitch <laughs> like that was a good episode Every time I hear that term, even though it predates this, I think of that, the meme with the, with the two bitches. black chicks with the bags. <laughs> and <they eat> them. <laughs> me too. Me too. <laughs> In our bag. We've been ruined by meme culture, but. Yes. No, but we were like, that was a really that good episode. Us. And I liked that it like, because it was talking about divorce. And I feel like each season has themes. Really? And, yeah. And season two was definitely about like divorce, independence, learning who you are, that mm. kind of thing. Because the other one, the other one we're about to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, it was, I it I got warm and fuzzies when I listened to this episode. Because I was like, this was a good one. It was a good one. Um, in the, I listened to the reading, which I don't always do, because I'm like, that's a lot of caring. Um, when she was talking about excuse me sucking dick or no about being rough and she was like I don't think my ex has ever like I don't know that she'd ever done that with him or whatever Mm -hmm. and I just wrote bitch ass nigga ex-husband in my notes (laughs) (laughs) yes bitch ass nigga ex-husband bitch ass nigga ex-husband that's all yeah I mean it was that was a that was a wild one like yeah also just thinking about like how far we've come and i think i was talking about a nigga i had just met like yeah you were because you were like i told my hand some of the ignorant shit that they said about (laughs) you having cancer going nowhere right right (laughs) stuck me in your pussy like no um yeah definitely listening to this i was like ugh fuck that dude <laughs> it, yeah he got yes he did curb, to get to the <laughs> curb uh-huh. so yeah this was a good one I just, I just feel like that this episode really it shows us where we were in a specific time but at the same mm-hmm. time like really and this was like right before we knew the pandemic was hitting so oh, so really? it was also like just uh, mm. It was a very different time. It's like a time capsule, but also I remember listening to it and being like, maybe people will really get something out of this episode. I hope so. I feel like this yeah. one people will. I hope so. I mean, I, obviously I hope y'all get something out of every episode. Like that's why we do it. But this one just felt like very personal. Like we shared a lot of shit. It definitely felt like a journal, like we were journaling or yeah. cataloging. So. And it was still early enough that we weren't like resharing stuff, you know what I'm saying? Because now we in season five, like, you know, I first of all, I'll be having to remember if I told the story already, because, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but like, there's there was still so much unshared at that point, and this because of the the subject matter of the book, it was just like we was like, let's go. Yeah, let's see, where, let's see where here's all it of takes our us. stuff exactly. Yeah, so. yeah. okay. So this is a tender one. Tender love, tender, tender love, love, love so tender, holding me close, close to you, baby. baby I, I surrender, <laughs> and with that. Why we whatever you need. <laughs> Wait, can I just oh, say? Yeah. So y'all, <laughs> Erica comes up with the um the songs for the episodes because 
If y'all haven't noticed, all of the whole episodes, the nine interviews are named after songs. Mm -hmm. Ooh, if you didn't notice, I don't know how you could not notice that, yeah. but mm -hmm. just in case. Um, and so I, you know, you she sends them to me so I can do the graphics. <laughs> be like bitch a white wallet i'm like okay i'll find a new one <laughs> yeah so they're but only they're all by problematic white white friends yeah but i think we i don't think any of those have made it through because they i'm don't. always and, like but every no. time i try propose i'm like okay she's unproblematic and karen's like nope yeah because i think it was kelly clarkson last the last yeah, uh -huh. time it was a white person and yeah. no not unpro not problematic but you know it's just like on um they gonna, and she gonna do something she gonna do something <laughs> and we're gonna be like you know what now we gotta yeah. check update everything exactly so yeah we never do but no what i was gonna say is every time i then go to do social like the songs be stuck in my head. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like walking around singing the most. Usually the songs be like from our childhood. It'd be like old ass R&B, which is great. <laughs> Again, I'm in my auntie bag. Yes. But it'd be songs that I completely forgot about. And then they'd be so good. And they'd be stuck in my head just from like mm -hmm. doing social or whatever. So thank you for that gift of remembering songs that I once truly loved. You're yes. welcome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now y'all can listen. Bye. Come here. Come here. Get off. Hey, Keith. Fuck these niggas <laughs> up. Is that what he said? I think so, yes. I don't know if you'd be fucking niggas up anyway. Take hey, Keith, you will always have a place in my heart. Or that uh before I let go. Nonetheless, hey y'all. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to this week's episode of the Turn On. Um, this week we are gonna jump right in it. We are reading A Taste of Her Own Medicine, which was published in 2019 by Tasha L. Harrison. This book came highly recommended by two of our listeners, uh, Michelle and Nicole, and this one hits a little close to home. Mm -hmm. So sit back, relax, get your wine, get your weed, get your whatever you need and enjoy. A Taste of Her Own Medicine by Tasha L. Harrison. The hand between my legs shifted to cup me more fully, the heel of his hand creating a delicious pressure against my mound. I rolled my hips and a bright spark of pleasure made my eyes roll back in my head. Poor baby, he whispered. Your tight little pussy's still aching, huh? This kind of talk, this dirty talk, I always thought it was silly. I wondered how it could be sexy, but I swear, when he asked me about my tight, aching pussy, all I could do was nod. I know it is. I'm aching for you, too. He shifted in his seat and his right hand grabbed at his stick. I watched him, mesmerized by the way he handled himself, wondering if he wanted me to handle him that roughly. I was never rough with Eric. He didn't like it that way. But could I be that way with Atlas? Hey, he said softly, drawing my attention back to his face. What were you going to do to me when you reached for my pants by the falls? He asked. Now that the moment passed, I suddenly felt shy about my thoughts and actions in that moment. I didn't really think it through. I just wanted to feel you on my hands. Hmm, he grunted. You still want to? And just like that, with that simple suggestion, my palms tingled wanting that intimate caress. Yes, I said with a nod. I want you to. Can you? He begged. Right here? I asked, glancing around. It was dusk and the parking lot was full of cars, but no one was walking around. Right here? Upstairs? I don't care where. I just need you to touch me. I don't think I can spend another night like this. We kissed again and I felt him tremble when my hand rested on his chest. He was practically vibrating. Right here, I said. I can't go upstairs with you. If I go upstairs, he nodded, understanding the things I left unsaid. 
I wanted him. There was no denying that, but so much had happened today, and I had crossed so many boundaries, and I knew that if I went upstairs with him, I was going to want more than just a touch, more than just a kiss. His hands wouldn't be enough. Okay, he agreed, then glanced around the still quiet parking lot right here. I gathered up his soft t-shirt and slipped my hand under it to touch his muscled chest and drifted lower to caress his belly, the ridge typography of his abdomen. When my fingers tangled in the trail of hair that led to the place between his legs, his whole body quaked. You okay? Yes, I just want your hands on me. Okay, I whispered and tugged at the drawstring of his sweats. His desire was so acute it seemed like physical pain. I knew and understood how that felt. It's the same way I felt in the greenhouse, but I'd never known anyone to feel that way about me. The dust deepened around us, casting the world outside the car in shadow. It made the interior of the Subaru feel cocoon-like. Condensation formed on the windows, adding to that secretive intimacy as I reached into his pants. He was big and hard in his pants and pulsed on my knuckles skimmed the silky fabric of his boxer briefs. I broke away from the kiss to look down at him, to watch myself reach into his boxers and take him in my hand. He was smooth and velvety soft against my palm. Atlas hissed and lifted his hips to tug down his pants a little further. His stick, now free of his constraints, leaped into my hand. I closed my hand into a loose fist and drew it up his length. Oh, God, Sonia, he breathed. His head fell back against the headrest. I looked at him. God, he was so damn beautiful. His eyes were closed and his thick lashes made dark shadows on his sculpted cheekbones. He rolled his hips, urging me silently to draw my hand down his thick length and back up again. He swallowed, and I tracked the way as Adam's apple bobbed. I had no idea what I was doing. It'd been more than a year since I'd even touched a man intimately, and I'd only ever been with my husband. Hey, I whispered. Atlas opened his eyes and looked at me. Show me how you like it. I drew my hand up his length again. Do you like it hard or soft? Do you want me to put my mouth on it? Shit, he cursed, and his dick grew harder in my hand as if that was even possible, and a bead of pre-cum formed at the tip. I leaned over and laughed it up. Jesus, Sonny. Show me how to please you, I begged softly. His big hand closed around mine, tightening my grip, then drew both of our hands up and over the fat, wet tip of his dick. On the downstroke, he thrust upward, forcing himself through my clenched fist. The sight of it was so erotic that my pussy clenched, releasing a gush of moisture that dampened the crotch of my leggings. Needing him inside of me in some way, I wrapped my lips around the tip of him again, and he whimpered. Like that, I whispered. Hard but slow like this, I asked, squeezing him and drawing my hand up over the tip. Yes, he nodded, thrusting into my hand again. Just like that. He hooked his hand around the back of my neck and pulled me in. His kiss was deeper, hungrier, more reckless. It took all of my willpower to keep my pants on, to keep my ass in my seat, to keep from sitting on that beautiful dick in my hands. Atlas grasped at me, kissed me hard, then pulled away to watch, seemingly torn between wanting me closer and wanting me to make him come. I pulled away to take him in my mouth again. I've never felt so compelled to suck a man's dick before, to see this strong, devastatingly handsome young man come apart because of me. I teased him, sucking hard on the tip, and every time his hips lifted the tiniest bit, thrusting deeper into my mouth, I knew what he wanted, but I waited until he asked for it. Please, Sonny, he begged. His hips rolled upward again. Please. I moaned and swallowed him down, taking him in as deeply as I could until his cockhead hit the back of my throat, 
Oh, fuck, Sonya. He moaned loudly. Fuck. I looked up at him. He was gone. Lost on the edge of bliss from what I was doing to him with my mouth. Baby, oh, baby, I'm about to come. I hummed, closed my eyes, and took him in deeper. Oh, fuck, you just gone. <laughs> no, baby, wait, no. He made a sound that was somewhere between a chuckle and a moan, tensed and came, flooding my mouth and moaning my name. I swallowed him down, sucking and licking every drop from his dick until he started to twitch and jerk. He pulled me off of him and brought my lips to his. Why'd you do that? He whispered, kissing me hard, that same hard, hungry kiss he'd given me at the start. Could he taste himself on my tongue? Why'd you do that? You didn't have to do that, he said, his voice full of gratitude. And was that reference? I know. I wanted to. You're amazing. Jesus, Sonia. He kept kissing me. It's been a long time since I've done anything like that or even wanted to. I pulled away a little so I could look him in the eye. Thank God you came when you did. I was two seconds away from crawling over this console. He shook his head. This is a complete 180 from crying when I made you come in the greenhouse this morning. I shrugged and slid my hand under his shirt. Maybe it's the come to me oil, but there's no denying that you bring it out of me. Alice sighed. Same, he murmured. So much same. He covered my hand with his. You laughed before you came, I said, remembering that moment. Is that normal for you? I, I don't know. My attention is usually focused elsewhere. No one's ever mentioned it before? No, his brow furrowed. Is that your way of asking me how many girls I've been with? He asked, smoothing his hand over my cheek. I, no, I just thought it was cute and unusual. But now I was wondering, how many women had he been with? Who was the last woman he was with? Was she my age or much younger with a firmer ass and a belly without stretch marks? He stopped my self-deprecating thoughts with another kiss. Maybe we'll talk about that next time, when you actually come upstairs and I actually get you in my bed. I shook my head. I can't. I know, you can tonight. I just wanted to let you know that this changes nothing. I still want you. So don't go home and lay awake all night, recounting every minute that we spent together today, looking for the one thing that you did that might have turned me off. Only one of us needs to do that. I rolled my eyes. You did nothing wrong. You mean except come in your mouth after you suck my dick for like three minutes? Was it only three minutes? Atlas nodded and looked a little sheepish. I glanced at the clock when you... He rolled his eyes. It was three minutes, maybe four. And now I'm humiliated. Excuse me while I tuck my flaccid dick back in my pants. Atlas... I reached for his hand and laced my fingers into his. It doesn't really matter how long you lasted, especially since I can still feel you so big and hard in the back of my throat. Jesus, Sonia, he said for the third time this evening. He brought our joined hands to his mouth where he grazed his lips across my knuckles. The look he gave me made me squirm in my seat again. Maybe all of this dirty talk wasn't so silly. Welcome back. That was an excerpt from A Taste of Her Own Medicine by Tasha Harrison. So, Killa, as I said, this touches very close to home. Mm -hmm. Oh, divorce bitches. I know. Okay, before we jump into that, let's just get to the uh, situation at hand. When this nigga said, a guy that makes you abandon your responsibilities and make love all night, bitch. Like, I, it flashed back to, like, those times where you, like, meet a guy and everything's sweet and y'all go and have a night of fun. And then, like, 
two days later, you emerge from his house <laughs> like, oh, oh, shit. The sun's so bright. <laughs> exactly. Your girlfriend's like, bitch, where you be? <laughs> that line just like touched a, touched a nerve in my little horse spirit. <laughs> I was like, ooh, I remember that. Um, so we had a moment of appreciation for our good friend, Dry Humping. Mm. Uh, was it dry humping? Yeah, I think it was. We said people gave up on dry humping. Oh, yeah, before. And, and uh, oh, first season. Yeah, bitch. Yeah, you yeah, was there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, with the woman who was, who was with the older man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, bitch. Mm-hmm. Our good friend, a hand job. So, here's the deal my hand jobs suck. Yeah, I'm not I, I feel like my hand job suck, but I feel like her hand job was really great. Mm. But I think that she probably thought about it and was like, this wasn't a good hand Boy, job. She didn't stay with the hands for exactly. long, though. No. Right. She popped her mouth on down there right quick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I mean, like, I one, which is was, also my experience. Yeah, which, yeah, exactly. You never really like you never do a hand job to completion. Right. Right. I don't, I ha- well, I'm sure people do. I just don't think I have. But that's because I don't feel like it's a good. But is I have it? been told that I'm good at it. Yeah. But it don't. But it don't like feel it. like it don't yeah. feel right. I think the problem is that you really got to use lube. Spit is not enough because it's just on your hands and it's not continuously coming like when it's in your mouth. What? <laughs> <laughs> Continuously coming. What she said. <laughs> um, yeah, so I appreciated the whole scene just reeked of like divorceness. Mm. Because like, don't you remember when when you first start dating post-divorce? It is a lot like for me, it was a lot like dating, like when you're first dating. You know, like Hmm. you got to be home at a certain hour curfew because you got to go relieve the sitter or y'all sitting out in the driveway. (laughs) Next thing you know, you giving a hand job and a hand in a car. That is a thing that has happened. Right? Yeah. I hadn't really thought about it that way. It's it's definitely is return. It returns to, you know, back to like, oh, we're doing this shit all over again. Nine times out of 10, if you're anything like me or killer. You had a mama. My mama was Kenria. After me, who you going out with? Mm-hmm. Tell me a whereabouts. Drop a pen for your location. Mm-hmm. So um, this book itself. Oh, shit. We didn't give the, the background oh, story the- of the book. <laughs> oh, damn. We jumped all into That's it. That's okay. okay. We'll do that right quick. So, okay. It stars Sonia mm-hmm. and Atlas, who, uh, of course, is aptly named because he has strong shoulders and he can bear the weight of the world on them. Um, so I know. So Sonia has been divorced for about a year. She was married to this dude named Eric, who we find out over time is a fucking asshole. And uh, she has two kids who are in high school and she has decided that she need, wants to start a business because she needs to support herself outside of the business that she worked on with her husband. She basically helped him build his business. <clears throat> and so the story starts with her going to an entrepreneurship class and her teacher is Atlas. And when she meets him, she loses his shit because he finds as hell. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. And then it's clear that he also he from the very first moment they meet, he's flirting with her. And then it's just all like from the first moment, literally from the first moment. And then she just wrestles with what it means to date as a divorced woman and as a mom. And also she struggles. She struggles a little bit with her age because she's a mm-hmm. little bit older than him. Right. Yeah. She's 40 and he's 30 and she makes a huge deal out of huge him. He's like, oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like a big, big deal for her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's how I got to the whole divorce mm-hmm. and, and dating <laughs> things. Um, this nigga was wearing sweats. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love some sweats. Not only how they look, but like because you can see everything. They're easy access when you're like doing nasty things. Mm-hmm. You can just slip a hand down there because ain't nothing worse than like having a nigga have to lift his hips to <laughs> unbutton <laughs> some button down. Fly but it's still, it's, it's like it's like their thought wear. It is totally thought wear. Yeah, it's a fashion over of men's clothing. Well, they have they have fashion over shit too now. I know, but it ain't it don't be hitting <laughs> like a pair of gray sweatpants. It's do. true. It leaves nothing to the imagination. <laughs> nothing to the imagination. <laughs> okay, um, so back to this divorce 
and dating mm-hmm. thing. Do you have anything to say? Anything else? Oh, no. Th- I was going to ask if you had anything else to say about the sex itself. So I love giving head. You love giving head. Mm-hmm. And this scene explains like why good head is good head because it's not even like I want to please you it's like no I need to have this in my mouth right now yeah it is it's like and and I think for folks who don't love it like that's the part that's missing yeah is that they don't don't, for me it very much turns me on that is foreplay for me yeah it's like a you know a part of me getting ready and um it seemed like that was also a part of her getting ready yeah yeah but then there's that other part that we talked about on the show when she was like you know to see him like lose himself that abandon that comes with it that's a huge part of it for me I like the control aspect of all of that yeah yeah Yeah. so I was I when they yeah so Tasha explained that really well very well and it was just so like beautifully written like no I need to taste this right right now now. (laughs) so and when he was saying I need to take I need to feel you on my body like I need Mm. to feel you touching me Mm -hmm. oh (laughs) man this man can talk some shit like he definitely has the gift of gab Mm -hmm. and I am just and won her over to that like you know the reason that we started and ended the excerpt where we did is because it starts with him talking shit Mm -hmm. and she's like I ain't never really you know I always thought that shit was silly and then by the end she's like well maybe (laughs) (laughs) you know maybe this works I think it's very, it's well known here that I like to talk. Mm-hmm. I, I like to sex talk. I think I could probably be a phone sex operator. Like mm-hmm. I'm that, I love a good talk. And yeah, it's kind of corny. Like if I'm like talking to you right now, but in the moment, mm-hmm. bitch, it is <laughs> delightful. Yeah, I hear charming niggas out they pants. Uh-huh. Be like, come on. Lift mm-hmm. up them hips. <laughs> Pull them panties down. <laughs> I hate it when you call them panties. I like to do it just to make them angry. Mm-hmm. It's funny to me. Take them panties <laughs> off. <laughs> Take them panties off. Okay, so we um, were talking about dating after divorce. Mm-hmm. Cameron, what was your dating situation like after divorce? Walk us Messy. through it. Um, so I went straight from divorce into a pseudo relationship with an old flame. I think a lot of people do that, though. Yeah. I mean, am I, it's easy. Well, it was easy. And also, you know, you know, this situation, this guy was somebody who I dated before, who we went to school with. And there was always this. He was like my what if guy. Reunited. And yeah. it feels so good. So it was like we had both gotten married. We both gotten divorced or I was in the process of it. And it was like, well, shit, let's try it now that we're both actually available. Let's try again. Mm-hmm. She got messy. <laughs> a lot of stuff happened. Dot, dot, dot. Yeah. And it ultimately did not work out. Um, but I thank God for that because it brought me to a better place. But so then after that, I was by myself for, ooh, I didn't start trying to even trying to date for like a year and a half. I was just mm-hmm. really focused on my own shit. And then one day I was just like, huh. Why okay. were you by, why were you? Were, was it self-imposed or was yeah. this a... I just was like, I don't want to, I don't want to be bothered. Yeah. Nigga, you had a fast. Oh, no, before that. Oh, okay. No, no, Sorry. that was before I'm like that. Trying you were like, trying to prompt me. Yeah, I'm trying to no. get you to. <laughs> okay, no, yeah, no, uh-huh. for, it was, there was a a year of me just not being interested in dating. I think it was a year. And then I decided to go on the apps, got my ass on Bumble, started dating. It was not great. Mm-hmm. Uh, catfish by dudes who posted pictures 15 years younger than they were. <laughs> um, oof, all kinds of shit. Jackhammer dick, lots of. Ooh. Ooh. When was the fast? I'm getting to the fast. I think the fast was before. It was that, not. Though. No, it was not. Okay, sorry. <laughs> My, sorry, y'all. I'm really on some like girl. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I had a few months of de- of Bumble dating that were not great, mm-hmm. and then I went on a date with a guy. And had a panic attack. Like not on the date, but I got home. You don't remember this? Mm-mm. 
this was the the nigga who uh, we went out to eat and the roach was crawling on the table at the yeah. uh, uh-huh. Senegalese spot and he just like brushed it off and yeah. kept eating and I yeah. was like nigga you eating with your hands what is happening <laughs> anyway so went on a date with that dude mm-hmm. got home I was it was a day off so we'd done like a lunch date and I was like oh this would be cool do a little lunch date come home lay on my couch for the rest of the day and I had a fucking panic attack mm-hmm. and um, that was what got me back into therapy Actually, that day, I remember I called you and was like, what's your therapist's name? I need Mm -hmm. some help. And I realized later that it was the date that had sent me there. And, you know, I found out later that I had PTSD from relationships with men and all of this stuff. And so one of the very first things that she made me do when I started therapy was go on a men fast. The fast! Exactly. Sorry, I finally got there. (laughs) So um, it was supposed to originally be for 30 days. And I remember I had like a date schedule with somebody and she was like, well, you can go on that date, but you need to tell him on that date that you not you can't talk to him for a month. I wasn't allowed to flirt, to sext, to do anything really with any man because I date men. And uh, a month turned into three months, yeah, which turned into six months. Yeah. Um, and then so at the end of the six months, after a whole bunch of work, she said that I was like ready and sober around you know, the shit that made dating not great. And then I started, I got back on the apps and started dating again. And it was a lot better because I was making way better choices. I didn't give niggas chances, honestly, Mm -hmm. is what it came down to. I had a set of criteria and really strong boundaries that I had built that allowed me to be able to better, um, it gave me a better picker. So were you dating for relationships or dating for fun? I was dating for relationship. I knew that I was ready after having done all of that work that I wanted to find someone that I actually wanted to build with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was out there looking purposefully for somebody who I could see myself with. Okay. Yeah. So we're here. Um, This this is called the turn on. We talk about sex. Talk about the sex (laughs) during this time. (laughs) Uh, There wasn't a lot of sex during that time because most... So I, I, I was breaking it down to my partner. We were just kind of talking about how dating was as a woman on the apps. So let's say I talked to 10. I, I matched with 10 people. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> maybe of those 10, maybe four of them would make it off the app to like a phone call. And then of those four, maybe two of them would make it to a date. And then I would go on a couple of dates with one of them. One of them would make it past the first date. And then I go on on several dates with another one. And then we would end up fucking. And then either it would work out or it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a ton of sex. It's like a a funnel, like a narrowing down of people before I got to the ones. And I didn't mean I waited a long time to have sex with them, the ones who made it through. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But um, the quality (laughs) was just not there. And because I was dating with a purpose in terms of actually trying to find somebody who I actually like beyond just fucking. Hey dog. Um, There wasn't a whole lot of sex. Not that second time around. Mm -mm. Okay. Yeah. What about you? What about the first time around? Uh, There was some bad sex and there was a couple of instances of great sex. And one nigga who I was the second time around who I've talked about before. I feel like he, he was, Probably really into domination, but didn't wasn't honest about it and upfront about it. And so I felt that he was trying to hurt me in the course of having sex without us having had a conversation about it, which made things not cool. Yeah, but yeah. even the dominant guys that I've de- dealt with, it wasn't a. I've had, I've dealt with dominant men, not sadists. Right. And I think he was ultimately he was a sadist. sadist. Yeah. And which is fine. But talk to me about yeah. it. <laughs> like, and I don't mind a dominant man. I don't want to say this. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. but when, when I called him out on it, that's when he ghosted me. So, mm-hmm. but that's cool. Um, how was sex the first time without like with someone other than your husband? <sighs> Sorry, my eyes closed. It was amazing. <laughs> It was so good because there had been, it was the what if guy. So mm-hmm. it, we hadn't had sex in years before then. So it was like all this pent up energy. Mm-hmm. And because we'd had sex before, we both knew each other's bodies already. So mm-hmm. I still remember what worked and he still remember what worked too. It was fucking fantastic. Good. Yeah. Good. Mm-hmm. 
All right. All right. So tell us about your post-divorce situation. Um, post-divorce, I initially, right after I, well, during my separation, I reunited with the old flame mm-hmm. and um, it was good. We had a good long weekend. We literally locked ourselves in a hotel room for a weekend and had some good, nasty sex. So that was great. Um, and then post, then once I actually, actually like said, I want a divorce, I think I filed or no, after I said, I want a divorce, my therapist put me on a fast mm-hmm. and mine was 60 days. Was it 60 or 90? I think it was 90. It was 90 days. But it got longer because you ended no. up coming off after. Oh, it just uh-uh. started way mine after was, mine. Yeah, uh-uh, okay. Yeah. But you finished after I did. Yeah. 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 So it was a, it was a 90 day fast. And I literally would like, I couldn't, cause I flirt, like I flirt, like mm-hmm. I talk, like with I everybody. flirt with everybody. I'll be on the phone with the Verizon tech and I'll flirt. <laughs> so it was really difficult. Um, and, but it was good. It was good to kind of like clear my mind and my brain of boys Mm -hmm. you know like sometimes I get boy crazy and so it was good to like not (laughs) have to not have that as something I'm thinking about Mm -hmm. as I'm trying to like figure myself out um once it was time to to come off the fast I definitely was like planning a grand opening party like a Mm -hmm. we remodeled and come in (laughs) take a look first first five people in with a coupon gets in free (laughs) kind of thing um, but it didn't quite happen like that. It mm-hmm. was just like, yeah, okay, this is, mm-hmm. I can do it and I haven't found anybody to do it with. Um, we I, put you on Bumble. No. Uh-uh. Yes, we did. That wasn't until like December. I came off fast in August. Oh, right. So, um. Came it was off, January 1st. <laughs> yep. So I ga- <laughs> came off of fast and, um. One of my girlfriends who always knows somebody who knows somebody introduced me to this guy that was traveling a lot and mm. old man served great dick. It was great. Like I travel, meet him in a city. We have a good long weekend of just nasty fucking. And then we go on about our business. It was fun. Um, and I kept that situation up for a minute. Um, generally, I was just kind of like I knew that I didn't want to jump into a relationship. Mm -hmm. I was just ready to just, you know, have some good sex. (laughs) He still be, does he send it to, you know, (laughs) niggas like to just test, keep it open, keep the lines open. It's like Mm -hmm. when, um, in the winter, when they tell you to keep a drain running so the water, so the pipes don't freeze. Uh huh. He love to keep that drain open just so the pipes don't freeze. And that's fine. That's fine. Cause I do the same thing. I definitely (laughs) have my every three months, Hey, big head. Hey, stranger. Text that go out. So it's whatever. Um, After that, I, yeah, I pretty much stuck around on that. It was weird. Like it was for me, like just dating had changed so much mm. between the time that I was b- yes. when I, before I started dating and after I started Absolutely. dating, like dating and courtship had really changed. Mm-hmm. And so it was it was just different and I kind of had to wrap my mind around it. Like it took a lot for me to even want to put my, put a, you know, yeah, profile up. We didn't like have that before we got married. People weren't, people were, but it wasn't like apps or anything. It was literally like, like Yahoo or dating um, or like, you know, like, like match or, yeah, it was right. like, it was like, you know, computer. it was very, very different. And so I think everyone was looking for like, not that it, there was the illusion of we're looking for like partners mm-hmm. in life. And it was like, nah, y'all niggas just trying to I'm say these apps lend themselves more to sex. <laughs> yeah. Which it's fine. Whatever. Yeah. Um, so right after Christmas, I told myself that I'm ready to get on. I'll be ready to get on the apps. So New Year's Day, I came mm-hmm. to Killer's house and we set up my profile. Mm-hmm. I'm very good at writing Bumble profiles. Yeah, she is. Um, so yeah, she set up my profile and I got on Bumble. That was the only thing I really was on. Mm-hmm. Matched with a few people, you know, Kenry gave me all the tips and tricks. I, I, like I knew what to do well before. Like I didn't have to do the, um, uh, the trial and error because mm-hmm. Killer did it all for me. So, um, I did that. I met a few people. I met one guy who, you know, like 
we would have been actually we're still really good friends it just did not work because we had like fundamentally just (laughs) very different views about life and raising children and all that and also like i don't know if i want more kids and so it's hard to Mm -hmm. well first the the goal of it initially was to be fucking but Mm -hmm. then i actually started liking a dude Mm -hmm. and i was like oh this is a danger so then i kind of started i i went about it backwards because I was fucking him and I was like this is a good fuck buddy but then I started catching feelings Mm -hmm. and I was like oh wait when I should have just vetted for that before I started fucking him that way if things changed you would already know I'm still good yeah and so yeah it was one of those like oh this ain't gonna work I don't see this working down the line Mm -hmm. so we had to part ways um yeah so you know i've done the app stuff i meet people on it i mean again i'm a big flirt so i meet people just in organic situations Mm -hmm. went on vacation met somebody Mm -hmm. um and that was random yeah very random but you know it worked so yeah so now i'm still dating i mean like i i will have like a week-long period where i'm like oh let me get back on this app and I'll get on the app and then be like, well, there was a reason you haven't opened this app in three months. Digging through the trash. Digging through the trash. Digging, I was like <laughs> digging through the trash for a hamburger yeah. that was easy to eat, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so I recently got back, well, not, yeah, recently got on the app and met somebody that's cool and that kind of thing. And I, I'm, I'm still not quite ready for a relationship, I don't think. Mm-hmm. However... When I do look at fuck buddies, I try to think of if they would like if mm-hmm. I were to catch feelings, is there anything barring like yeah. fucking up the situation from this being something? So like, no, I'm not gonna have a fuck buddy that's, you know, that ain't doing shit with his life because if that dick's good and we got a good conversation, I'll be like, ooh. I think I love he. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. So I try to avoid that kind of situation. Um, but yeah, I don't think I'm quite ready for a relationship yet. Um, I think it's primarily because, you know, I'm still trying to figure myself out. I mean, I know what I want. I think I know what I want. Um I got a lot going on, y'all. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I'll share with everybody now. Okay. So back in December, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So, um, yeah. That's a lot. There's a lot happening. Mm-hmm. Wow. And I think I might actually cry. And I haven't mm-hmm. cried about this in a, a shit since I was diagnosed. Um, I have surgery next week. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Yeah, like that makes dating really weird. You know, I mean, not that it makes it weird because actually one thing I've learned is niggas don't give a shit about that. that. Like this one nigga was like, they ain't sewing up your pussy, are they? <laughs> they ain't taking it, but they ain't doing a mastectomy of your ass. <laughs> I'm like, God, gee, thanks. Niggas ain't shit. But at the same time, like, you know, you're, I'm about to undergo like a very, long process Mm -hmm. and most of the guys that i'm dating even the guy that i like literally met like two weeks ago is like you cool i'm cool let's see what happens you know so i'm lucky in that nobody's like "Mm, i'll let you later yeah and if you are cool i completely understand it um but uh i think with all of that that's going on it's difficult for me to focus on building a relationship yeah, with that takes a lot of energy yeah so i mean like i have people that i'm dating and maybe if they stick around that'll show you know like maybe mm-hmm. something will be revealed in the healing process and mm-hmm. there you know like there's maybe there's some like grand gesture that i'm like oh, i can't be without you you know <laughs> but um yeah so <sighs> I don't think I'm I don't think I'm quite ready for a man because right now I need to be my own partner mm-hmm. and I need to be uh from what I understand, treatment and recovery is going to re- require like a inordinate inordinate amount of selfishness mm-hmm. on my part. 
And it would be wrong to like drag somebody brand new into this and make, you know, like, cause it's going to be all about me. Like one of the things that's very difficult for me to accept right now is yeah. receiving the outpourings of help and love from everyone. I mean, I know people love me, yada, 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 but it's been very difficult. Like just having people, like I literally just had a girlfriend text and say, Hey, I'll come over and help with laundry. And I'm like, bitch, like, <laughs> No, you know, and so I, I think it's a, it's a wrong foot to start out on in a relationship for it to be all about me. Like I, you know, like, I don't think that I'm going to be able to. You also can't force people to do things. So it's not as if, if, if let's say with this person who you just met, Mm -hmm. if it turns into something and he's here, just as things are getting tough, you're, you're not forcing anybody to do any fucking thing. Yeah, but I just think it's got free will just like you do. Yeah, I just it's I think that it's like I feel like relationships are supposed to be reciprocal. Not it's not a it's not a Well, see, we talked about equity equity, versus reciprocity. But I think you're right. Equitable. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that there's any way that I can be an equitable well, I guess I could ebbs and flows, boo, ebbs and flows. I just I like I just feel like going into this. I have to make it all about Erica. As you should. And And either somebody deals with that or they don't, but you can't force them to do it. Okay, bitch. (laughs) Fuck. Anyway, so. You know me. I'm like, fuck that. Yeah. So that's where I am with like the dating thing. I'm still having really great sex. Like Mm -hmm. these titties have been on a world tour. (laughs) Lord, they have been on a world tour. Um, they deserve, they deserve as do I deserve. Um, but yeah, so it's been, uh, it's been an interesting ride post divorce. I think that I'm a very different dater now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, what helps What makes you different? Um, my picker is better. I am comfortable saying what I want and what I don't want out of a relationship. I'm, and I'm more I feel like once you've been, at least for me, I know what it feels like to be like stuck in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, feel like you're stuck in a relationship where you just stuck and you're trying to live and be somebody you're not supposed, you're you're not, you you aren't who you aren't. Um, And so I am going into all relationships with like a just ignorant level of transparency Mm -hmm. and I mean I don't tell everything on the first day but I'm very clear about who I am and what I want and what I expect Mm -hmm. and if it's too much if it scares you off if it feels like it's too much of a problem that's fine because I'm not gonna change or shrink or hide Mm -hmm. who I am and what I want for the sake of being with somebody because that shit is hard as fuck Mm -hmm. to maintain it's exhausting and for what yeah so you can look up and not know who the fuck you are yeah and I like I never understood the whole I can do bad by myself until mm. I like truly was like, no, I can do this shit on my own. Like I'd rather struggle and be by myself and come home to Whew, peace, peace, come home to peace. Like I think my wasn't my word last year, peace and prosperity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my, yeah, my word last year, each year I pick a word, a few words for the theme of the year. Last year was peace and prosperity. Mm -hmm. And I definitely found peace. Like Mm -hmm. even like thinking about all that happened. I think I told you this before. All that happened last year. Like I lost my granny who was my favorite girl in the whole wide world. Because she was dope. Yeah. I got fucking diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. But 2019 was like one of the best years of my life Mm -hmm. because I found peace. So even in the midst of all of this bullshit, like I found peace. I'm peaceful. I'm happy. I fucking launched my podcast. I I have a better idea of who I want to be and what I want my empire to look like, you know? Um, So yeah, like I, and I, and I don't have anybody, you know, and I'm fine with that. I mean, maybe, you know, in 10, 15 years, if I'm still like this, that might change. But right now, like I have found peace and comfort in just, my own little situation, my own little setup. And so I don't want to add anybody to that that isn't enhancing it or making it easier. Mm -hmm. Like, and I I know that relationships can be difficult, but 
I think the difficult part should be the logistics part of it. Maybe not logistics is probably the wrong word, but like the fitting two lives together, mm-hmm. fitting two personalities together. But mm-hmm. like we should genuinely like each other. Mm-hmm. You know, we should genuinely want to spend our time together, you know, that kind of thing. And so I think now that I have a, I'm better in like my pillars and the pillars of Erica and what she wants and who she is. Now that that's more solid, Mm -hmm. the rest of it just kind of fills in the blanks and it works out. So, yeah. So you think you're different dating? Oh, fuck. Yeah. Um, I was not healthy or sober when it came to dealing with men because my codependency was such that I put everyone before me. Mm -hmm. It meant that I put men before me, even ashy, raggedy ass niggas that didn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. That was just my, I was a, let me take care of you, ho. Um, And there's nothing wrong with taking care of the people who you care for, but not to the detriment of yourself. And so there was a whole lot of caretaking and a whole lot of um, making myself small in order to make small men feel bigger Mm -hmm. Um, to the point where, uh, yeah, I didn't didn't really know myself anymore. Yeah. Um, I remember when I, you know, finally left and, you know, he would come talk at me to tell me why I should stay with him and I would literally look through this nigga and he'd be like I don't even know you anymore and I'm like you Good. didn't yeah, right. like, yeah. you didn't you really don't. know yeah. me to begin with I am back to being myself um, and so that has made me better mm-hmm. post that um, I think one of the most important lessons that I learned and that made me better when it came to dating is the lesson that you can always leave yeah You know, long before I left my ex-husband, I wanted to leave. I had cause to leave and I chose to stay because I thought that people deserved a No, not even that. I was I had convinced myself that everybody deserves another chance. And that may be true, but not on my back. Yeah, but I know that. I ain't say I gotta give that (laughs) second chance. (laughs) I wish you and your new girlfriend the best. Exactly. (laughs) But um I stayed and then spent a whole bunch of time just waiting for him to fuck up again so I could leave because I felt like I had made the choice to stay with a nigga who cheated on me. Ooh, I didn't know that, but oh yeah, yeah uh-huh. like literally, I'd be like, just, just let me catch you, let again. me catch you, yeah, uh huh. And it's so like, I well, can, why do I? Where, right. where is this rule coming from? Yeah. Right, some shit that I had imposed when I literally could have just woke up one day and been like, you know what, fuck you and fuck this. Mm-hmm. And um, when I got to the point where I realized I could always leave, Mm -hmm. that changed literally everything because not just in relationships, any kind of a bad situation, even, you know, I have anxiety and like going to new places fucks me up. And we were just talking about this when I was going somewhere when we were out of town and I had to remind myself that if I didn't like it, I could turn around and I could leave. Yeah. But I, it had been so ingrained in me and I think in a lot of black women that you have to be, you have to try, you have to give somebody another chance. It's up to you to keep things going and make him happy and blah, blah, the fuck, blah. Um, and so it made it easier when I started dating because if I didn't like some shit a nigga said on the phone, I would get off. I would send him a text that says, we're not a good fit. I wish you well. That's what I would always text niggas. Mm-hmm. And then I would block them. Because Mm -hmm. I don't owe you an explanation. And I will move on with my day and with the rest of my life. And so it made it so much easier for me to put myself out there. Mm -hmm. Because I realized I didn't have to stay anywhere I didn't want to be. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I do. I so my little codependent self, part of me, part of it is codependency, but part of it is just this is who I am. Mm. I'm a little old black lady. Like I turn into a (laughs) granny when my friends come over because I want to make sure they ate. I want to feed them. I want to cook for them. So when I started dating, one of the things, one of the rules I gave myself was like no cooking for these niggas, like no cooking for them unless they until they like earn. Yes. Being cooked for. So did you have any rules like that? Oh, um, I never let anybody in my house. 
That was a rule that um, my therapist and I actually set up rules for how to keep me sober with dating. So I, people had to prove that they were worthy of coming to my home. Um, I also did almost exclusively daytime dates mm -hmm. um, because they had to prove that they were worthy of me getting a sitter and like arranging and being away from my child. Mm -hmm. So I would meet folks for on my lunch break, like, mm -hmm. You know, that made it easier for me, again, that I can always leave. There's a set amount of time attached to something. I'm not, le not letting anyone into my own space. They weren't in my vehicle. They weren't, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't know where I lived. It made me feel safer um, in that way. Uh, <clears throat> and so in that respect, I didn't cook for anybody. You know, I like to bake for niggas and everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it would they would have to, like, earn the baking and all of that mm -hmm. shit. Yeah, I think those are probably the biggest ones. Daytime was really important to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to give anybody um, the privilege of having my very precious nighttime mm -hmm. hours. I think the only person who I went on a first date in the evening with is the mm -hmm. person who is now my current partner. Yeah. That's it. But and you didn't have a kid that weekend, so I it wasn't not. a. It wasn't a, a me a hardship. It was like it was literally we had been planning a date for the following week during the day, and then her dad actually got her, and I didn't have anything to do, and I was like, "Hey, yeah, let's meet up." Mm -hmm. And then it just went from there. Yeah, that dating as a mom thing is a whole nother beast. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm really lucky because my ex and I have uh. We have a really decent schedule. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so it allows me to have a lot of flexibility. Um, and because I have such flexibility, I try to not date on day, you know, like the days that mm -hmm. I have him. I do break it occasionally for like, you know, if there's a concert or something, yeah, or something like specific, that. But yeah. I try I try to kind of keep our time, our time. Um, but that and babysitters ain't cheap. Mm mm. And so, and then also, like, you just think about, like, coming home and then having to, like, parent post-date fucking mm -hmm. sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was just like, you know, we'll just do it on weekend. I'll yeah, have my kids. I would just rather not. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Um, did you have, do you have any other old habits that, I mean, we know we talked about the things we do, but are there any old habits that you had that you were just, that you look back now and you're like, oh my God. I do have a big one. Uh, so I remember back when I was, so I got married before most of our friends. I got married at 26. Mm -hmm. So I was super young and married and had all these ideas about what it took in order to make some shit work that now I'm like, bitch, shut up. Um, and one of the things was that I I would never say no if he wanted to have sex. Oh, I remember that conversation. I yes. was like, bitch, don't tell my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and it led to me doing a lot of shit I didn't really want to do. Resent and, and, and just like resenting him every, and yes. resenting yourself or like mm -hmm. how the why the fuck am I here? Why yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and it still didn't it still wasn't satisfying to him because yeah. he still ultimately it still wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He still wanted to have more sex than we were having, even though we're having it constantly and he was still cheating. And you know, that's always that reminder that cheating is not about you. Mm -hmm. Although I just always remind myself the nigga cheated on Beyonce. So like the nigga cheated on Beyonce, nigga cheated on anybody. Yeah. Um, but so that was one of the, I contorted myself in that way. Um, and toward the end, like maybe the last year that I was married, I finally was like, fuck you. Like if I don't want to have sex, I'm not having sex. It's not fun for me. It's not going to be fun for you because I'm not into it. So no, you know, we all hit that. We all hit a point. Oh, like oh. looking back, <laughs> we all, there's a moment in our marriage where it's over like I it's over it's before over. you know it's over yeah it's over before you know it's over mm -hmm. and I remember my point was where I was like okay well you're gonna live that way I'm gonna live this way mm -hmm. and I knew your shit was over a smooth year before yeah, exactly yeah. and and that was when I was like okay you do I, I was like this is how I'm gonna feel comfortable being in this marriage for the mm -hmm. rest of my life you live your way, you do what you want to do, and then I'm going to live my way and do what I want to do. And should we overlap from time to time? Then bonus. Then great. Mm -hmm. It's like, how the fuck is that a marriage? Like a marriage, a forever partnership? Yeah. Like, but yeah, like I definitely thought like this was, this was my way of reconciling mm -hmm. this decision I made. I was yeah. going to say fucked up decision, but no. this decision I made I that, that ended sourly, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so one of the things that I that 
has come up for me now as a person in a really healthy relationship is that I sometimes catch myself feeling like I need to have sex when I don't necessarily feel like it because I was so used to being with a man who literally I found was counting how many times we had sex was um, if I could tell we were going to have a bad day because he would like ignore me in the morning. He was a narcissist. They, you know, are manipulative. Um, But it would be because he felt like we hadn't had sex the night. We hadn't had sex the night before. And so he would pout and act like a child. You know, that's pouting shit. Like I cannot stand a passive aggressive person. Yes. You know, that's one of my biggest pet peeves in the world. It makes my teeth itch. And it's crazy because I was dating this guy and he was passive aggressive as fuck Mm. and would like, and I'm like, yo, like, is there a problem? Mm -hmm. We good? No, we fine. But then he picked me like a little pissy bitch. But then I got to ask again, like, we good? Well, you know, I was really upset about, you know what? I can't read your mind. We did that shit twice. And I was pissed that we even got to it twice Mm. because I don't like, I don't, we're adults. Like, let's be adults. Let's be like, a hundred about it Mm -hmm. and I shouldn't there shouldn't be anything that I do I mean not I shouldn't do something and you be uncle if you can't fucking tell me yo you hurt my feelings or I'm feeling a certain kind Mm -hmm. of way or hey it would have been nice if I got some head like you probably won't get any but nonetheless like we should be able to say something to one another you know and if we can't then why are we together like you literally had your face in my booty hole. Mm-hmm. Your whole tongue was in my booty hole. <laughs> but you can't tell me you pissed about something. Mm-hmm. And so it was just like, you know what, bro? I'm good. good I'm good, you. love. Enjoy. And looking back, I was pissed at myself that I even allowed it to get that far because I should have seen that like pouty, passive aggressive shit. I can't we see stand the flags when we see the pouty nigga. You I know? mean, I think that that's one of the things for sure that I know that makes me a better dater now is that I see them flags and you I don't yourself. just see them, I heed them. Because yeah. it used to be like after I was married, then I could see them, but I would just tuck them away and not do shit about them. Or I might even say something, but there was no intent. It was so he could talk me out of the flag. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now I'm like, nigga, this is a problem. Either this changes or that changes or I go kind yeah. of a deal. And it's not even on some angry shit. Like no. if you, if I tell you this is a problem, you're like, no, but I really like this. Okay, that's then, great. And I wish okay. you the best. Like right. the dude that I was talking about, like we're great friends now. We talk regularly. We keep in touch. Mm-hmm. We do stuff together. But it's because, look, you ain't for me. I ain't for you. But we're cool. And you're so able to be honest about it. Yeah, that. like let's be honest about it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I definitely feel like when I first divorced, I was on this, I'm going to forever be the fast auntie Auntie Erica will never be married. And then I sat down with a group of women, most of which were on their second marriage. And they were just talking about how great it is Mm -hmm. because they were able, they were better at defining what they want and saying what they want and Mm -hmm. saying, this isn't what I want. And just more in tune with themselves. Mm -hmm. And they were saying how great their second marriage is and the people that they're married to, uh, that they were married to are. And it's because they, I think because they did the work and I mean, this was a small group of women. So I say, I mean, I know women on a third and fourth marriage, you know, so Mm -hmm. obviously they didn't catch it. But I think now I am more open to the idea of a second marriage, but it's got to be damn near perfect. I mean, I know perfection don't exist. Mm -hmm. I know that there's all, you know, like it's work, but there's a certain thing. The conditions have to be right. Yeah. The conditions have to be right. Yeah. So thing. On that note, I think that wraps us up. Okay. Thank y'all for joining us. Thanks for joining us. This is Erica and Kenya, two hoes making Making it clap. clap. This episode was produced by us, Kenry and Erica, and edited by Ballistic. The theme music is from Brazy. Hit subscribe right now in your favorite podcast app and at youtube.com slash the turn on podcast so you'll never miss an episode. Then follow us on Twitter at the turn on pod and Instagram at the turn on podcast. And you can find links to books, transcripts, guest info, what's turning us on and other fun stuff at the turn on 
And don't forget to email us at the turn on podcast at gmail.com with your book recommendations and your pressing sex and related questions. And you can support the show by leaving us a five-star review, buying some merch, or becoming a patron of the show. Just head to the turnonpodcast.com to make that happen. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Holla.